join with me in the call to worship. We give thanks to God with our whole heart. We give thanks for God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Though high above all things, God sees the lowly. Even when we are in deep trouble, God makes us live again. The love of God lasts forever. And please join us in our opening hymns. They're printed in your bulletin. All things bright and beautiful and in the garden.
You may be seated. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Confident in his ever gracious, never failing help, we come before the Lord, confessing our sin and seeking forgiveness. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic days, too happy to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless ways, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the last. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O oh God. Please take a moment for your own silent prayer of confession. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please receive the assurance of pardon. If, had, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would now be lost in sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side. And so we are forgiven. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made our heaven and earth.
receiving our morning offering. God has been gracious to us. Let us be gracious to him. We will also, during the offering, we will be singing as the deer, which is in your bullet. Yeah, you stay seated. Will the ushers please come forward?
Our Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 138. It's on page 577 in the Pew Bible if you want to follow along. It's Thanksgiving and Praise of David. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name in your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haunting he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. So as we get started this morning, I want to tell you something really wonderful. You may have seen it in the blast, but our incredible session has been working really, really hard to try to figure out who we are going to be in the future. We've talked a lot about what our legacy has been and who we have been in the past, but now we are talking about how we are going to be in the future. And one of the tasks that they have had is to write a new mission and vision statement. And so I want to share with you that new mission statement because that mission statement is something I want all of you to know, and it is something that I think that will be very important because we're going to take that mission statement and then use it to frame everything that we do. So that mission statement is so easy. It is four words. So I think we can memorize it right now. What do we think? It is love God, love others. Can we say it together? Love God, love others. It's pretty simple, pretty easy. It's also pretty hard too, but it is a beautiful task that our session is now looking to see where we are heading in the future and with the focus around setting God as our center and that we are called to love God and then we are called to love the people that God has placed in our life. It's pretty awesome. So we had just got back from Lake Tahoe. We came back a little bit early because of the faux hurricane. Um, and we came back early, and we, but we had a fabulous, wonderful time. It was a very active time. We went whitewater rafting, we went on a long bike ride, and we went uh, on a boat one day and jumped in the water. It was lots of fun. And when we were whitewater rafting, yes, we took our four-year-old whitewater rafting. He sat in the middle. It, it was fine. It was, little, it was a little bit scary as mom. But when we were in the slow parts, when it was just like simple, gentle water, our guide was telling us about how the Truckee River was formed. Now, the Truckee River is what feeds into Lake Tahoe. And the Truckee River was formed through erosion. But he was also telling us about when, when ice caps had come through and pushed up the rock. And I'm always so incredibly fascinated by rock formations, because rock is such an important part of our life. It is such an important part of our life because it is what forms the foundation of the world. It is what forms, you know, as it erodes, it's what breaks up and makes soil and the sand on the beach. It's all from rock. And I am always so fascinated by the fact that the older rock is at the top and the younger rock is at the bottom. Like, that just is so strange to me. But rock is incredibly important. 
And today we're going to be reading a passage from Matthew's Gospel, and Jesus talks about the importance of rock. He talks about the importance of what we build the church on and what the church is built on. And this is from Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. And we'll start there. It says this. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi was an incredibly important place in Jesus' ministry. He was either doing ministry in Caesarea Philippi or in Jerusalem. Those were the two places that we typically find him. So he asked his disciples, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah and still others Jeremiah, and one of the prophet, and or one of the other prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Jesus answered, oh, sorry, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So I want to pause there for just a second. So if you ever see Peter in art, if you ever are looking at like the 12 disciples in stained glass and you want to know which one Peter is, look for the guy with the keys. That's Peter. So you can, next time you see art and you see the disciples and there's a guy holding keys, you can impress your friends by saying, oh, see the one with the keys? That's Peter. It's because of this passage. Um, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. So, this passage has been an argument between the Protestants and the Catholics for a long time. And the reason why it is an argument is because the Catholics believe and that the Pope is from this moment. That Peter was the first Pope. And then every Pope from then on touched the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand of Peter. So from St. Francis now, not St. Francis, that's another person, Pope Francis now as, our, as the Pope all the way to Peter. And George always jokes that I'm not a real pastor because I, didn't, I wasn't ordained by the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand that touched the hand of Peter. He doesn't actually. He has said that, but it's mostly a joke. Um, but this passage is so incredibly important because Jesus is saying in this passage that it is Peter who will be the rock that the church will be built on. Now, Peter is not the greatest candidate to be the church, the rock that the church is built on. Peter is uneducated, he's a fisherman, he's a businessman, but he's, you know, not, maybe not the smartest guy. He is uh, impulsive. We talked two weeks ago about Peter jumping in the water to walk on water. He is, does not think before he speaks. And the, in the next passage right after this, Jesus is telling them what's supposed to be coming, and Peter doesn't want to hear that Jesus is going to die, and Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. So Peter, and oh, by the way, he denies him three times on the night that he dies. And so Peter is not the best candidate. And yet Jesus says to him, no, you are the rock. His name means rock in, in, uh, in Greek, Cephas, is, means rock. It is the rock with which God, Jesus is going to build 
the church home. And yet, he's not a most likely candidate. He wasn't voted most likely to succeed. So why in the world did Jesus choose him? And I think that the reason why Jesus chose him to be the rock is to show us something. Because none of us are the most likely candidate to be fill in the blank of whatever God has asked you to do. And you're like, oh, I don't know if I should do that. I'm not that qualified. But Jesus says, no. I'm going to build the church upon the unlikely candidate. The person who's willing to jump in. The first person. I mean, Peter is the one who says, you are the Messiah. Not the other disciples, what were they saying? They were saying, oh, maybe it's Elijah, maybe it's John the Baptist, maybe it's... But Peter says, no, you are the Messiah. And it was his faith and his trust in Jesus that made him be chosen. But I want to point something out, and I think that Matthew is making a point about this. So, we all know that Jesus spoke Aramaic, but the Bible is written in Greek. Now, the word for rock in Aramaic is, like, doesn't have a gender. You know how in the Romance languages, how they're, they're, certain words are gendered? But in Greek, words are gendered, just like the Romance languages. And the words that are used, that Matthew uses when writing down the gospel, are gender. He uses the male version of rock, and he uses the female version of rock. And he uses the male version of rock in calling Peter the rock. But he uses the female version in saying, and this is the, the rock that I will build this church on. So why do, why do I make this point? I make this point because I believe that Matthew was making the point that Peter will be the human that will continue this on, but the rock is the church. When we talk about the church, we talk about the church being the bride of Christ. And that it is Christ that is the rock that we will build the church on. It is not a person, but Christ, who we will build the church on. And we, as the bride of Christ, will carry on the church. Because guess what? Leaders are going to disappoint us. Leaders are going to not do the things that we want them to do. Leaders are going to make us sad. Because they are not Jesus. They are representatives of Jesus. And there are people in our lives who are going to disappoint us who are followers of Jesus. But as long as we lean into the rock on which we stand, that is where we will find our way forward. That is how we will find the future. Because even though Peter was the rock that Jesus built the church on, in the book of Acts, he and Paul, who were the two big leaders of the early church, got in a big argument. And they got in an argument about the future of the church and how the church was going to be led. And this argument they got into was Peter said, this is my call. My call is to bring the word of God and to bring the story of Jesus to the Jews. And Paul said, no, 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 we need to be bringing it to the whole world. And they had the first council of the church because they had the, their first argument. And they had to decide who was right and who was wrong. And what did they do? They said, Peter, you do what you're called to do. Paul, you do what you're called to do. Because Unfortunately, 
people are going to disappoint us. But what won't disappoint us is Jesus. And we have all been called to do something for Jesus. And it is not because that we are special or important or because of our role. It is because Jesus sees something in us special and important. He sees in us something that he wants to build his kingdom on. And that is each and every one of us. Today, before the service started, you got a little card. Did the other one get a little card? You got a little card. Now, one of them was the attendance card that's in front of you that hopefully you'll fill out. But the other one is this. We are going to do a little prayer practice around this. One side it says, we are but dust and ash. And the other says, the world was created for me. So I want you to take some time and sit in prayer right now. And I want you to hold it with the card like this. And I invite you to pray. God, we know our humanness. We know our frailty. We know the parts about us that we don't want to show to anybody else. We know that we're like Peter. We shouldn't be chosen because of the list of things that we can name ourselves. And God, in the silence, we lift them to you now. Friends, I invite you to turn the card over. To be reminded that the world was created for me. The world was created for us. It was created for us because God chose us. God chose to love us. And God chose to let us serve. Despite all the reasons why we think we can't. And so, here are the words that we are beloved, that we are chosen, that we are called. That we have a purpose. That we are the hands and feet of Jesus. Called in this time, in this place, in this moment. To 
ที่Remember that we are beloved and chosen. Steadfast God, your love and faithfulness are always with us. We thankful. We are thankful that with you there is no end to our hope. By your power, all exiles will come to an end. All things will be restored. Therefore, we pray with confidence to you, who are above all things, knowing that you take notice of those who are bent low, that your strong arms hold, take hold of those who are in the midst of trouble. To anyone who is in despair, send your deliverance swiftly. For those longing for home, return them. We pray. To a place of safety and love. For anyone who is estranged from one another, we pray that reconciliation may be accomplished, or that an ending may become the pathway to a new beginning. Loving God, we promise comfort to the one in sorrow and help to the one in trouble. Lift up all so we can see your salvation. Help us and help the nations to learn your justice and to practice it. Silence the deafening drumbeat of war, so that we may learn a song of thanksgiving. And before the world wears out like a garment, like a garment, before we turn your Eden into a waste place, correct our habits. We desire to be better caretakers of the garden of the Lord, and we thank you. For the gift of the church, and for the varied gifts and perspectives you place among us, help us to welcome the diversity of your design in ways that enlarge witness in the world. And we thank you especially for Jesus Christ, who has called us to be His body in the world. And we pray all things in His name, who taught us to pray, saying, "Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name." Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I invite you to put these in your Bible or someplace where you'll see them. To be reminded that we are loved, even though we are broken. And now let us stand and sing our last two hymns of this wonderful hymn sing month, where we've gotten to sing all these fabulous songs. As we sing, "A mighty fortress is our God, and God be with us till we meet again."
are and do some other things. And we have a couple of preschool families who are affected by that. I, at least four, is that right, Alexis? At least four families who are affected by that. So this week, if you could bring water just to help those families out, if you can bring bottles of water, because that would be great. Oh, someone's shaking their hand. They solved the problem. They solved the problem. Yeah. Praise yeah. God. OK, good. I had not heard the news, so good. Check. <laughs> also, everyone head over as we celebrate, really, the matriarch of our church, Maggie Artisan, who lived to be 108 years old. Let up. She didn't want a service. She wanted a celebration, to celebrate the gift she was to each and every one of us. And now go in the grace, peace, and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the rock on which we build our lives. Amen.